Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Spooky ocean stories and experiences. I've got a couple although not particularly paranormal. Be me. 16-year-old Aussie on holiday in Bali. Staying on an island about two-hour boat ride from mainland Bali, closer to Lombok. Island is surrounded by reefs with heaps of sea turtles and other exotic wildlife. Snorkeling with uncle and other family friends, looking for turtles ECT. Uncle along with me and a couple of the older kids head out to the edge of the reef. Spot the biggest turtle we've seen the whole trip. Uncle is watching over everyone, ex-drill sergeant, would go through hell and back to make sure the people he is looking after are all right. At the edge of the reef I start getting more focused on the massive blue expanse of the ocean right after the drop-off of the reef. Always been really into ocean and sea life, so naturally I'm in awe just staring at this massive expanse of ocean. Floating at the top looking straight down into the shadows. I felt like I was somewhere between a trance and just being in complete awe. Look forward and can see a reef shark swimming towards me. Is slowly swimming straight towards me, I just stare at it thinking how cool it is to be in the wild with a shark. Realize I probably shouldn't stick around. I turn around to go tell my uncle. WTF. I've floated easily 100 meters from them. About the same distance between me and the others as between me and the shark. Survival backstroke back to uncle and others. Tell my uncle about the shark and he decides to pack it in, we head to shore. I was so confused on how I managed to get separated from them by that much. I couldn't have been distracted for more than 20 seconds and there was no current or no harsh waters pulling us anywhere. Uncle even admits he had no idea I drifted that far. Not really of the same like as the op, but includes the ocean as like a main facet. When I was around 9 I went on a trip with my uncle and cousins to Maine and saw the ocean for the first time. On maybe the second day we were there, I remember we were navigating some rocks and crags, looking through the little tide pools for crabs and stuff, when we submitted this larger rock face that overlooked a small section of beach that was littered with smaller boulders and old traps and shit. When me and my cousin came to the top, we right away knew it was too high and slippery for us to climb down that side. So we went to climb back down the side we came from and when we turned around there was a 40-ish year old balding guy with a backpack on at the bottom, with one hand up on the rock face like he had been in the process of, or had intended to climb up where we were. When he saw that we noticed him he stopped and looked at my older cousin, just frozen, almost as though he were afraid of us, then stopped what he was doing and jogged away toward this stone wall area where the parking lot was. When we climbed back down finally, I could tell my cousin was really frightened. Naturally he grasped the scope of potential there on how strange and precarious what had just gone down was more than I did I guess, and we started walking back over to where my uncle's camper was. The entire time we are walking back, my cousin seemed super apprehensive. When we got back and told my uncle he flipped out and we walked into the parking lot with him but the guy wasn't around anywhere. My cousin told my uncle he saw the guy get into a pickup truck and when we were walking back that he saw the guy was using binoculars inside his truck to look at us as we walked. It could have been just a coincidence and the dude was genuinely sightseeing but his behavior was way too suggestive of like, ill intent. My cousin and I sincerely believe we were close to getting abducted that day and somehow spooked the guy. Or maybe he just had second thoughts. This was in 99 near Kennebunk. Sorry for the wall of text but green texting is friendly to me. Up here, this happened on the same trip. 
Family and family friends hire a shitty local snorkeling guide. Dudes are dodgy as fuck end up accusing us of stealing shit ECT. Anyway out on their shitty dingy boat taking us around the islands. The youngest kid out of the group is this 5 year old girl. Everyone watches over this girl like a hawk, adamant she does not go missing whatsoever. Snorkeling at one of the spots with family friend and brother from recollection. Mum of the little girl swims over to us absolutely fucking distraught. Had a look in her face I'll never forget, a deep primal fear that she had lost her daughter. Oh fuck oh fuck she can't find the kid. Everyone is fucking panicking literally cannot find the kid anywhere. Eventually I come across the kid with another one of the mums from our group. They said they'd been lost, though the boat had left them behind. Holy fuck that was such a tense moment, the thought of that girl being out in the ocean had me fucking terrified. Not to mention the look on the mum's face, I'll never forget that. Go snorkeling off Aruba. Swimming around the shallow water, it's pretty cool. They take us further out to see a shipwreck. Think it'll be amazing. We get there and I get in the water. Look down. Can just see the tip of the mast. Sudden, complete fear overtakes me. Totally frozen. Actually pissed myself I'm so scared. Best friend has to help me back on the boat. Nothing spooky here. I just wasn't aware of how scared if the ocean I am. The ocean is one of the most frightening yet mystifying aspects of the planet. Think about it, total desolation on its own is a relatively unsettling concept for most people and the oceans are entirely that, an extremely expansive plane of emptiness. When we're on land and we are isolated, we have some physical connections that still link us to the mentality that although we may be alone, we are still in a way grounded for lack of a better term by the earth, like a tree for example, hell, even a rock. In the ocean, no such connections exits. Out there, it's just you and the water, there is nothing out there for you to relate to normal life, your mind tries to make connections but can't find any. From the blank canvas that the emptiness of the oceans create, your mind begins to project. This is where that aspect of mysticism comes in, when your subliminal thoughts have dominance in the emptiness, you begin to see, feel, and think things that you might not otherwise. You might to consider the notion of a higher being, see things that just aren't right, and be emotionally inflicted in ways you wouldn't expect. It's because of this effect that the ocean has that it can be so terrifying, yet still make us yearn for it. It really is incredible. As a regular scuba diver, I can say that the ocean is absolutely the most thrilling and ominous place. If there's anyone lurking, I do have a couple of stories. Nothing paranormal, but they were pretty spooky, to me. Over the summer, a group of friends and I decided that we were going to try and document Great White Migration. I live in Nova Scotia in Canada and there's been recent evidence that during the end of the summer seasons, whites are supposed to be in the location for a short period of time. This evidence is so recent, that there's very little pattern to truly prove this pattern, and we wanted to debunk this theory for more than just a coincidence. Near the end of June or early July, about a month before they're even supposed to be around, we went for a dive shortly off coast to monitor the temperatures of the water. My location is surrounded by the Mexican Gulf Stream, so we figured that they'd be most likely to show up in the warmer waters, along with the other weird fish that show up through there. We were about an hour into scouting out a location, not very far offshore and a place that we're all incredibly familiar with, when we saw a shadow. Now, if you know anything at all about diving in Nova Scotia, you know that it definitely doesn't have the clearest oceans. So, okay, whatever. It's a tuna, or some shit. Those fuckers get huge. It was only when the light hit just right did we realize that it was a shark. Once again, whatever, spooky, but we're in the fucking ocean. The few of us who saw it gathered together because we're always taught that there's safety in numbers. By now, everyone saw it just kind of swimming around. Also, by now, we realized that it wasn't just a mako shark, it was a fucking white just swimming around, 
doing its fucking shark thing. It didn't approach us and barely gave us a second glance, but I could have thrown up by how freaked out I was. We learned that either the waters were unseasonably warm, or there's far more to the supposed pattern than we thought. We went back a month later with a shark cage, and we didn't see a thing. There's threads here for Inawoods, and even one for underwater, but so few people talk about on the water. Sailors are such a suspicious bunch, and I'm a fan of the idea of seasteading. What sorts of things could we run across if there were more people dependent on maritime travel? I'll start. The Flying Dutchman has several origins, but the most popular one was a Dutch merchant that came to the Cape of Africa looking to dock during bad weather. She couldn't get a pilot to guide her to port, however, and was lost to the weather. It's reported that the ship will occasionally appear to those traveling the waters. One such eyewitness was Prince George of Wales, who would become King George V of England. He reported seeing the Dutchman off the coast of Australia, and remarked an eerie red glow coming from within the ship. When the crew of his ship were alerted and they sent a midshipman forward to scout the ship out, it had already vanished. I'll offer up another story, this time from a captain of a cruise ship who told me the story. Coming into port in Spain. Sun mostly set, behind the mountains. In the darkness is a bright red light. It moves slowly, almost like a satellite. Suddenly dips below the mountains. Pops back up vertically, not continuing its move across the sky. Makes a sudden turn and zooms past the ship much faster than before. Goes well beyond the ship out to sea and dives into the water. Disappears in the dark water. I've always found USOs interesting, particularly when mixed with the idea that a simple alien craft is simply capable of being in all types of environment, be it air, space, or sea. Used to scuba dive with mates back east would frequent a place called Ends Harbor. Did too many tours in Ends Harbor to count, we'd spend hours just exploring the depths. Water can get murky, but is clear for the most part. Spend some time in town among the locals and start hearing rumors about the harbor monster. Dismiss it as folklore nonsense, seen every inch of the place underwater and never saw anything. Cut to two weeks later. Buddy and I are doing our last tour before we leave. Dive to a relatively shallow area where a lot of schools are showing activity. When we swim through the first pass, we watch as the school breaks up, some swim up but some start swimming down. We watch as the downward fish seem to pass through the sand. On closer inspection there are gaps in the bed they are swimming through. We decide to follow the path of the slight cracks as it emerges into a substantial crevice along the shoreline. You would never see it with the naked eye, you really have to know where to look. Buddy and I are standing on the edge of darkness, just staring into the abyss, it's just wide enough for a person to shimmy down. Turn my head to ask him which one of us has brass balls big enough to check it out. As I'm turning he suddenly bolts towards the shore in a frantic panic. I follow suit and before too long we're out of the water removing our gear. I asked him if he was creeped out by how dark and deep it seemed. He shook his head, breathing heavily. I saw something move down there, it was fucking massive. I pried for more details and suggested the harbor monster jokingly. He didn't laugh. That's the last time we dove in Anne's harbor. Swim a lot as a kid. Really love the water. Grow up poor. Mom works at a fry truck on the beach during the summer and just lets me swim all day instead of a babysitter. Whatever I love to swim. Get in the habit of filling my pockets with rocks and walking around on the seabed. Really peaceful, just flat sand and pale blue quietness. Really easy to stay under for a minute or two at a time. One time walking around not paying attention. Suddenly there's nothing in front of me. Walked right into a drop off. It's just darkness below and I'm sinking into it. Rocks pulling me down. Start flailing, it gets dark quick. 
basically feel like I'm gonna die and thrash so hard I pull and kick my shorts right off. They sink down and I swim to the surface, I'm like over 150 feet from the shore. Had to go get some kid to get my mom for more shorts, never told her about it. I really should have drowned as a kid, I swam by myself a lot in places I shouldn't have but to this day I still love to swim and I'm still fascinated by the ocean, I'm just a lot more cautious now. Swimming kinda far out at the beach one day. Dad and brother swam back to shore to take a break and eat lunch. Our beach rarely gets sharks. It's not like Australia or South Africa where it's sharks all day every day but they are sighted a few times a year. See a fin approaching me. Fug. Then three more fins surface next to it. Thank God it's just dolphins. Sharks are solitary. Dolphins travel in pods. They surface near me and I can see their faces. One of them makes dolphin noises at me. They start swimming in a circle around me about 10 feet away from me. Remember that dad told me dolphins do this sometimes to protect people from sharks. Freaked out that there is probably a shark nearby but having dolphin bros to keep it away keeps me calm enough to avoid panicking. After a few minutes the dolphins are still swimming around me. I've been scanning the area but can't see anything else in the water. Catch movement underneath me out of the corner of my eye. A fucking 10 to 12 foot great white shark is circling about 15 feet below me. Keep my eyes glued to it as it circles for a couple more minutes. Dolphins are still there and they seem to have noticed it too. Dolphin clicking and then three of them dive to charge at the shark, other one stays near me. The dolphins chase the shark off. See those three dolphins plus the shark disappear heading away from the shore. Decide it's time to GTFO. The lone dolphin stays with me until I get close to shore. Too bad I wasn't timed because I put up times worthy of Olympic gold medals. My fucking dad and brother were off buying hot dogs when all this happened so those friends didn't believe me when I told them what happened. As I'm telling them about my adventure I see a group of dolphins jumping through the air and swimming away. I'm relieved they are all okay. This happened when I was a teen but ever since I've been able to afford it I make annual donations to a dolphin rescue organization. No not fucking SeaWorld. Around 13 to 14 years old. Visiting the ocean for the first time, the Olympic Peninsula in particular. All the campsites are fucking packed. Dad drives down some winding back road to a secluded beach. Parks a couple meters above the high tide mark, we fall asleep in the car. Wake up in the middle of the night, can't sleep. Quietly leave the car and walk down to the beach, put toes in the surf. Watching the horizon and the stars, was a moonless night. Notice a light fog has rolled in. Neat. JPEG. Watching waves break over distant islands. See waves getting bigger and bigger for a few seconds. Have slight panic over a tsunami and have a brief hero fantasy of saving my family. See lights in the fog. Wonder if it's a cruise boat or something. What kind of boat nears dangerous waters at 3 a.m. on a foggy night? They probably shouldn't do that. Lights look strange, almost like a cat's eye reflecting light at a certain angle. Haha, <laughs> eyes, that'd be spooky. Cthulhu Photogon, can start to hear the large waves sloshing, really starting to think I am about to witness some horrible boat crash. Realize the lights were coming from below the horizon. A shape suddenly breaks through the waves, sending water dozens of feet into the air it's the fucking Russians. Submarines don't have lights on them that's stupid as fuck. Wait no it's a whale. Whales don't have lights on them. What the fuck is going on? For a couple seconds, this shape with a pattern of lights lurches above the surface, taller than some of the islands which must have had treetops 40 to 50 feet above sea level can hear incredible waves. I must be dreaming. 
face plant into the surf to wake myself up. Get sand in my eyes. Look up. Figure is slinking back underneath. Suddenly another light, larger than the rest, illuminates itself at the tip of the figure, the front, based on the direction it was traveling. It's so fucking bright holy shit it hurts to look at. The light suddenly jerks, feel as if it had locked onto me. Realize it's a fucking eye. Hit with pure terror. Run back up the beach towards the car. Hear waves crashing, look back. Five foot plus waves are slamming the shoreline one after the other. If I hadn't gotten scared I probably wouldn't have seen the waves in time and may have gotten taken out to sea. Look towards the islands, no lights or creatures to be seen. Waves subside after a couple minutes, returning to the gentle surf from before. So mystified at what I saw that I didn't get back in the car, fall asleep on the back trunk. Wake up to my dad shaking me awake, angry because he thought I had disappeared and didn't bother to look at the car for me. Tell him what happened, he doesn't believe me and says I had a weird dream. Never forget what happened, pick related. It's really dark, but so was that night. Okay this is going to take a little while to get to the point, but basically the bloop is real and it's biological. Well I don't know really, my point is I am now absolutely certain there is something huge down there, that's alive, capable of producing noises like that. I don't know if the bloop was biological in origin, in fact to call this entire thing the bloop seems a little disingenuous. Look at all the unidentified ocean sounds there are, there's quite a bit. Slow down, Julia, upsweep, train, among others. Most of these are explained away with seismic activity while some have no satisfying answer. It's all a load of nonsense, I'm convinced. Most people would never know it though, because they have only the sound itself to go off of. In fact, the only reason I can come here now to make such a bold statement is because of a guy the first met some six years ago. He was an old Navy fellow. I guess he must have not been the best at finances or fallen on hard times, because he was working as an assistant dive instructor at the place I went to go get certified. He kept to himself mostly but when he did speak he was lively and funny, so I found him good company. I'd joke around sometimes and he seemed to understand my sense of humor, so we became somewhat like friends. After I'd gotten certified, I'm in Florida. I went diving a few times for a period of about a month within the area. There were nice reefs and stuff so I'd often run into the guy and talk to him. Eventually he confided in me that he didn't have many friends and his wife had died some time ago. Eventually, perhaps a bit reluctantly, he mentioned to me in excited, hushed tones about his discovery. I persuaded him to tell me more about this, and it's here you must understand why most people never reach the truth. He picked out a fat folder he kept under close watch and he started to show me what he'd seen. He had a picture of the bloop sound recording on there but it was just one afterthought amongst tons, tons of seemingly minor, uneventful instances and findings that occurred at sea. As I'd come to see however, eventually these did form substantial evidence for his little theory. Some stuff was weird. Like I remember there being a newspaper clipping in there from the 80s that described the strange find of a sea trawler. Supposedly they had drawn up, in very poor condition, something pretty enigmatic. It seemed to be a massive flap of just, cell mass. It was described as having a sort of milky translucence, and the entire length of the segment was estimated at around 80 to 100 feet long. The thing was clearly in bad shape though. Even as it rippled in the waves it was clear there were large tears in it, and these tears seemed to get far more numerous as the entire thing seemed to shrink and dissolve. The net brought up what it could but the thing just seemed to fall apart entirely. Pieces of the jelly-like substance literally seeped out through the holes in the net, and the bits that were brought on deck seemed to dissociate even quicker than they had in the water. I remember the clipping describing the weird find as having a texture like a jellyfish, but other than that there didn't seem to be any mention of samples being taken or studied. 
A lot of the stuff in there was pretty mundane though. There were a few clippings of similar shit in local papers, like two or three that all told of some jellyfish-like creature washing up along a beach or something. The segments were described as being like 10 to 16 feet in length I think. One had a printed picture of it. It didn't really look anything like a jellyfish though, except maybe in texture. There weren't any tentacles I could see, nor could I see a distinctive bell or anything, it just looked like a flat flap of something. But yeah looking through that stuff did get tedious at times. The guy had actually printed out Wikipedia pages to put in there about the life cycles of sea squirts, jellyfish, comb jellies, a bunch of stuff I can't really even remember. I should mention this happened over several days, the guy seemed continuously reluctant to discuss this with me, and I wouldn't push it every single time, though I was pretty pushy. He seemed to want to dance around the point with me. He'd start with all the mundane shit and recount it to me in sometimes painful detail. Did you know that sea squirts have a mobile form before they settle down and become sedentary? Yeah I do know, they're also an ancestor to all vertebrae life. Sometimes we wouldn't even look at the folder, I'd implore him to say more about what this was all about and he'd go on about his experience in the navy. He'd been on his share of submarines and while he didn't work on sonar he had a bunch of buddies who did, so said he liked to think he knew what sort of things were normal and what wasn't with regards to signals of that nature. That was also in the folder, a bunch of old naval logs. Weird charts and what not, I wasn't really sure what they were, but he explained to me that they were basically recordings of notable pings and audio sounds. He'd point to one and go, that's a whale, or, that's another submarine, or, that's machinery from an oil refinery, etc. All types of noise, mostly mechanical, but occasionally biological or seismological. Do you guys know about salps? Salps are basically free swimming sea squirts. They get around by jet propulsion and are actually very efficient at doing this. They might superficially look like jellies but they completely BTFO them in terms of cellular complexity. They have a bizarre life cycle, basically their form alternates across generations. They alternate from a solitary existence to a communal one where they bunch together, see pick related. Additionally they have an earlier stage where they resemble primitive vertebrates, having a little notochord. The salps can grow incredibly quickly, faster than any other multicellular animal when there is a phytoplankton bloom, then die off just as quickly. When they ingest too much food they run the risk of sinking to the ocean floor and dying. Do you guys know about zooids? Zooids are basically an alternative to multicellularity. Basically instead of one organism making different cells for a bunch of different purposes, Different organisms come together and each specialize in a certain type of organ to make a greater creature. Portuguese man of war and comb jellies are zooids. Basically these are the discussions I had with my naval buddy during this time period. It was in the summer of 2002 that my friend had the opportunity to discuss this with a scientist. Even back then there was already a lot on his mind and it was the conversation with this scientist that really let him crystallize his theory. At this point he'd already been curious about some mysterious deep sea creature for a long time, but it was sort of an on and off type deal, and his wonderings would stagnate for years at a time. Nevertheless at this time he caught a poster advertising a convention for marine biologists. The public was to be invited and there were to be talks, an opportunity for questions, and breakfast etc. The thing took place in one of those fancy, sort of cozy hotels nestled in the Florida suburbs. The talks were held in specific rooms, and attendance was pretty low, probably because those idiots scheduled it on Monday at 10 a.m. My friend actually skipped work that day just to go. He was the one asking most of the questions during the event, but he didn't want to press them too much for fear of sounding like some sort of lunatic, since all his questions were trying to point to what was turning and rolling in his mind. So after the talk they all went to have breakfast in the hotel's courtyard, 
and it was here that my buddy approached the scientists more openly in the hopes that they might be able to make sense of his experience. He had not yet told me what that was. He eventually ended up sitting down with a guy about 10 years older than him. He seemed friendly enough, seemed happy to get the attention, but my buddy couldn't shake a certain condescending tone radiating from the guy. There he sort of danced around the topic and made vague questions about what sort of life lived in the deep sea and if there could be anything undiscovered hiding there. He was surprised to hear the scientist answering the question somewhat in the affirmative. He also asked about sea squirts, asked if there was anything like a free swimming one. He was again surprised to know the answer was yes, and this is how he first learned of SALPs, which he would later research extensively. I want to take a brief aside here to mention something related. Consider how little we know, consider how well things can hide. Now I don't mean this in the gay sense that the deep sea could be housing the next action movie villain, I don't mean it in the way people usually associate those terms. What I mean is sometimes the best place to hide is in plain sight. Consider how little we know about certain obscure, small creatures nobody cares about. Now consider how much less we know about the genetics of those creatures. We haven't sequences very many of them, and we're certainly not at the point where we can determine what segment of DNA does what in an organism, nor can we say with excellent certainty about creatures seldom studied what genes are turned on and often when. Creatures can vary tremendously in their life cycles. Consider how so many insects spend the overwhelming majority of their life as a caterpillar. The genes for the butterfly have not yet been activated. And when it does become a butterfly this only occurs for a fraction of its life, a few days compared to years. Now pair this with the alternating life history of sea slaps and a picture begins to form. Anyway to return to my navy buddy's little conversation, it appeared someone had overheard them, another scientist. He seemed a bit rougher, sorta like a redneck but he saw a very passionate discussion taking place and ambled over from the rather uneventful table he was located at. The two caught him up on manners pertaining to the discussion. After the subject of salps and sea squirts had been exhausted, my buddy started to change the subject to the potential for enormous, yet undiscovered creatures. They scientists, again, were rather optimistic. I asked my buddy if they ever mentioned the possible energy constraints of such a thing, he said they didn't. Rather that they pointed to the existence of giant and colossal squids, massive creatures who still eluded mankind, as evidence that there might be more down there. Eventually the redneck-looking biologist mentioned the bloop, well, sort of collectively. Back then they didn't call it the bloop, and I don't think my friend ever used that word to list it either. The biologist just mentioned a series of powerful, underwater sounds recorded mostly in the 90s by NOAA. He mentioned their origin was a mystery and that they didn't seem to be mechanical or geological in origin. Both scientists agreed it matched the profile most closely of something biological, but said it would have to be several times the size of a blue whale to produce that noise. My friend responded, almost immediately, by asking if salps could produce sound. Or if there was any way a salp could evolve to produce sound. The original scientist just said that there wasn't any way, salps had no ability to vocalize. The second guy said it might be possible if they developed something like a sack of air, and at that point all it would take would be some musculature to provide vibrations and then you'd technically have a salp capable of making noise. The simpler an organism is the quicker it can evolve features that may seem radically against the essence of anatomy. A mosasaurs is never realistically going to evolve gills. Yet things like worms and jellyfish never cease to surprise us with how much their anatomy can vary and alter itself. Anyway my friend was always skeptical of scientists and at some point I'm inclined to agree, at least to some extent. I was researching the Fermi paradox the other day. Basically if life is supposed to be such a common occurrence why don't we detect advanced alien civilizations? Among the reasons listed were that they were present, 
just hidden, or what not. Basically something in support of UFOs. Here's how a scientist responded to that claim. He said he had, aversion to the idea, simply because of its long association with crackpots, gives crackpots altogether too much influence. This is the consequence of the snootiness circle jerking of high science. Once people start putting their reputation over their dedication to the truth or sense of curiosity, or ability to second-guess themselves, then that's when you get things like this. Scientists rejecting or largely refusing to engage certain topics simply because it goes against what's deemed respectable by their peers. Regardless my friend kept in contact with the acquaintances he'd made that day. And as he continued to ponder what was dominating his mind he'd often defer to them, asking all manner of questions. It was like this that he learned of Zuids. So now my friend was in a position to start piecing together the nature of what he thought lurked beneath the ocean. He figured the creatures already have a tendency to aggregate. Perhaps if this was taken further they could fuse more completely into one organism. Perhaps they could form colonies within colonies, different batches specializing in different structures. My friend made several crude sketches of what he thought the finished product might look like. They looked a bit like pick related, though a bit messier, with many small protruding tubes and sacs, which seemed to be asymmetrical in orientation. Basically a super salp, resembling a single one, but burdened with many other components. The theory goes that these things, throughout most of their life, resemble an inconspicuous sea salp. Indeed many likely go through their entire lives never deviating from this phase. Hell they might even be a species we know of already. But he figured, every now and then something, some set of specific favorable conditions must trigger a kind of bizarre and extreme metamorphosis to create the super salp, he theorized. Of course that leaves the question of why? And it is a big question. Why would an organism evolve to do this? What benefit would it have? Again he found himself unable to answer this question. So for a long time his research into the matter stagnated. My buddy eventually ran into the issue of energetics, and mainly its limits in the deep sea where there is not enough food to support the large, active predators we see shooting through the shallows. The answer eventually came to him after much research and talks with scientists, which were few and far between. Does anyone know what pick related is? It's a photosynthetic slug. The slug ingests either plants of cyanobacteria, I don't recall which, and they essentially have a mutualistic relationship where the photosynthetic creatures live inside the slug while the slug gets energy from the creatures, making it the only animal, if I'm not mistaken, that's able to derive energy from photosynthesis in this way. This is not the only creature to do this, and this is not an infrequent occurrence. Vibrio bacteria live inside many deep sea fish, squid, and shrimp and are responsible for creating bioluminescence. Anyway, with his resources and after enough pushing he found that there were creatures out there that did not derive their energy from the sun, rather the source of their energy was around hydrothermal vents. Chemosynthesis. The primary producers of this odd food chain are extremophile bacteria and archaea. It was suggested to him by a scientist that high hypothetical, super salp, might be able to grow to far larger sizes than normal if it had developed such a symbiotic relationship with these extremophile bacteria, because here it'd be able to feed on the chemicals from hydrothermal vents more or less directly. Remember how there's less energy the higher the trophic level? This skips all that. Couple this with filter feeding, which is likely to occur because it is likely to some extent plentiful food which triggers the aggregation process in the first place, and you have a creature that can get far, far more energy than expected for the deep sea, a phantom food chain if you will. Anyway after much reading and communication he refined his theory a bit. He was convinced that symbiotic salps lived and had various population pockets around hydrothermal vents. Salps that had evolved gas sacs and the ability to produce sound with them. This would serve as a primitive form of communication. 
He figured some rare event, perhaps only occurring every thousand years, would transpire. Perhaps a super abundance of food at a certain location would spur it on, or perhaps seismological activity would trigger it. Regardless he reasoned at this point the Salps would use either sonic or chemical signaling. When they sense a certain critical mass is approached they'd aggregate and fuse, forming the super salp. Why would they do this? Well he figured a super salp would be a much sturdier thing, with a much bigger jet with which it could move great distances. He also figured it must have some way to detect seismological activity, though I personally don't think this is necessary. He said it would rapidly cruise through the deep ocean in search of areas of seismological activity, indeed it is in areas of strong underwater volcanic, geologic activity where hydrothermal vents most often occur. Here it would find these hydrothermal vents and WOFT the emerging sediments from it, nurturing itself. It would make many such trips, spreading its progeny far and wide across all hydrothermal vent pockets it could. This spectacular stage of its life needn't last long, perhaps only a few weeks, maybe a little more for the colossal thing to do what it does before dying. Something my friend was very adamant about, which I'd only later figure out why, was that this creature was semi-rigid, it had some sort of skeleton, or maybe just strong tethers of collagen to keep it together. He reasoned maybe the bacteria were responsible for producing this, or at least holding it together. He reasoned the bacteria required extreme pressures to live, where the super salp to venture too far into waters not sufficiently deep. The bacteria would very quickly die off en masse, its support structure would separate from it, and it would basically fall apart. Well, it is here my story reaches its conclusion. I understand it's quite lengthy, and that may not appeal to all, but I wanted to get this across in its entirety. My long-winded story really comes to a close when I at last found out why my friend had become so obsessed over this matter to begin with. After a little over a week of being evasive, or providing unrelated info, or building up his theory, he at last divulged the experience. It wasn't his experience, it was the experience of one of his sonar buddies, stationed on a ship in the southern Pacific Ocean, very far away from our Navy friend. It was down there that he got a signal that seemed to defy logic. It was huge, almost impossibly huge, and it seemed to defy explanation in more ways than one. It was hard to get a good fix with it on the sonar, it seemed to be hollow, not completely solid. He kept on registering various discrete pieces that all seemed to be within the entire thing, whose shape sometimes registered more clearly or other times like a messy blur. It also seemed to be moving, and towards the ship at that at a speed very surprising for its size, about 6 to 10 knots, he'd later recall. He quickly alerted his superior, who analyzed the situation. He ordered them to turn to avoid the thing, but it was clear they wouldn't clear it entirely. In fact, they almost did clear it entirely, save for a single, noticeable scrape. The submarine made a sizable impact with whatever this thing was, and there was a noticeable pushback, this was not something entirely gelatinous but something very much semi-rigid. When they got up to the surface, all a bit shaken they noticed the ship's propeller was completely caked in a kind of organic goo. Sonar guy took some samples. The captain said he'd make a report, but when more dives in the same area reported nothing, he called off the idea, quickly dismissing what had happened as nothing out of the ordinary. Sonar guy took the samples into a lab for genetic testing. After a few weeks time he got the results back, with the scientists there positively declaring what was found was most definitely a sea squirt. He decided not to pursue the matter further, and this info was relayed to my Navy friend. What shocked him most was the scale of the thing the sonar implied, based on his friend's estimations, the thing was over 1000 feet long. I'd like to add a brief little epilogue, with things like these there's always important details you might miss. But there is reason to doubt the icequake hypothesis, and I find it hard to believe it. 
It seems like a band-aid to me. Something that was previously so widely assumed to be biological in origin is now found to be consistent with various geologic movements. I don't buy it. At the sizes and loudness we're talking about anything biological could be said to be consistent with the geological in terms of pitch and resonance. Seems the big deciding factor for it being geological is that the sounds all occurred near fault lines. Well, that's exactly where the super salp would be. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.